Okay, so welcome. Uh, the title of my message is called Met by Love. And this morning I'm going to be talking to you about the parable of the prodigal son. Okay, don't check out yet because I know that you might be sitting here thinking, gosh, I've heard that story so many times. But I would say that for, for me in my life, every time I read it, I feel like I get a new aspect of the unconditional love of God in it. And I love this story. I think it's one of my favorites in the entire Bible. Uh, for me, there's not many other stories in Scripture that points a clearer picture of the Father's heart. Now, you're going to hear me talk about God's heart a lot in this church, because one of the things as Christians, we have to keep praying and asking the Lord is to show us the Father. There's actually a movie out right now that I'm hearing is amazing called Show Us the Father. They call this generation the fatherless generation for a reason. And we as believers and even people in the world, we need to know the heart of our heavenly father. Because when we do, it changes everything. So my whole message today is going to be talking to you about what the father's heart looks like. And I mean, I, I try to tell this story everywhere I go, to every single person I can. In fact, if you were to have a, a bunch of atheists and agnostics lined up for me, people that don't believe, people from different religions, do you know the story that I would use out of a whole Bible? It would be this story. Because this story clearly tells us what the heart of God is like. And this is a story that I think the whole world needs to hear about who the Father is. And we have all these misconceptions about that. And see, the more and more church that I talk to people inside and out of the church, I see there's so much misunderstanding about the heart of God. Whether it's wrong teaching or a believer that misrepresents God's character, or for some of you, it's church hurt. You went to a church and whether it's church leadership or something happened in the church and you got disillusioned and unfortunately you started to adopt the attitude that that's what your heavenly father was like since that's what the church staff was like. And then there's other people here um, that had fathers that when we try our best and we fail, um, that gave you a distorted perception of God, whether it was an absent father or an angry father or a performance-based father where he loved you if you did what he wanted you to do. And we carry these wounds around. And that's why A.W. Tozer said, what we think about God, what comes into our minds is the most important thing about us. So I want you to think about, you know, I'm a father of five and I try my best and I fail. Um, I fail a lot. I do my best. It's funny, my friends send me memes about how hard parenting is, but this is something that happens sometimes. <laughs> As a father, I get to the end of my rope during quarantine. I like this one right here. Quarantine day eight. Have you been there before? Okay, then you don't have kids. <laughs> we get to those points where we try so hard. I want all my kids, I want to represent God so well to my kids. I want them to grow up and say, my dad was a reflection of the father. But you know what the truth is? There's failure. There's time where, you know, there's, I'm angry. There's time where I'm absent. There's time where my kids say, Dad, would you just get off the phone? And you know what? They're right. But we need a perfect heavenly father. It's interesting. Because of all the misconceptions that you see in Scripture, um, the Pharisees had misconceptions. The lost people had misconceptions. The, the Samaritans had misconceptions. In fact, if you read the Bible, there were so many misconceptions about God when religion comes in. And so one of the interesting things that I've come to, to learn about the Bible, church, is that Jesus came, not only um, that God sent his son to redeem us from our sin, but he also came to Show us the Father. You say, why did Jesus come? Well, one of the reasons is to forgive you, uh, for you guys have forgiveness of your sin, but also to show you what the Father looks like. Ooh, I'm not sure what to say about that. Um, um, but I, I like it, even though I can't see you because you're beautiful. Jesus reveals the Father. And so in, in John 14, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. 
Father. Philip wanted to see the Father. Show us the Father. We have all these misconceptions. Show us the Father. And Jesus answered, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And so that's one of the things that, that Jesus came to clear up our understanding because the religious leaders and the Jews, the people like myself that taught people the scriptures every Sunday morning, so many of them missed God's heart. And it became about a bunch of rules and about a bunch of religion. It became about, as Jesus says, you, you, you strain the gnat, but you swallow the camel meaning that you're putting yoke on people's shoulders that they can't carry. And they don't want to come to God because they always feel guilty and afraid and and condemned. And you know what? That might be your story here today too. But God brought you here to clear up some of that misconception. And the Bible in the... Ooh! Whoa! This is awesome! (laughs) Uh, I like it. I feel like the Holy Spirit is uh, giving me winks. Um, see, I'm not even going to ask you for an amen. How about that? I just want the lights to go up and down. Clear up some misconceptions about the heart of the Father. Because you know what's crazy is when I know my Father's heart, I don't have to approve. I don't need your approval. I don't have to perform for you. I don't have to go home wondering, hey, am I doing a good job? When I hear my Father in heaven say, this is my Son who I am well pleased. And I believe that what happens in churches is we start performing for people because we're not acting out of our identity. But when the Father loves you, the Father loves you. And that unconditional love, it can change the way you relate to people. So I'm telling you, there's no greater story than this story about the Father's heart. I just want to tell it to you and tell it to you again. Maybe I'll do a 25-week series. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. (laughs) There's like, everyone's like, I'm never coming back. So... As I was thinking about uh, this, I was thinking about the Disney movie. And does anybody like this movie in here? Uh, Okay, I'm going to go past that. Uh, Finding Nemo. Does anybody like Finding Nemo? Okay, okay. Thank you, Joe McGraw. (laughs) You're a true man. So if you you have kids, you watch Disney all the time. That's all you watch. Um, I have four girls, so I mean, my life is a Disney movie. But this story is about a clownfish, okay, a clownfish family who lives in the Great Barrier Reef. Marlin is the father, okay? And what happens in the story is uh, he, him and his, his wife, they have a bunch of uh, babies uh, that are still in eggs. There's 300, there are 400 of them, and, 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 they, and they live on this uh, barrier reef, so there's a lot of sharks and different things. But a, par- a barracuda comes one day and tragically eats all the babies except one. And it's a really, you know, sad part of the story. And Nemo is the one that's left behind. And, uh, and so what happens is Marlin becomes an overprotective helicopter parent, okay? Because it's his one son. And so then what happens is the worst thing happens is that Nemo actually goes outside of his protection area and d- doesn't listen to his father and he ends up getting captured by a bunch of scuba divers, separated from his father. And the movie's about how the, far, the father, Marlin, gets out of his comfort zones to find and rescue his son. And then Nemo, as you guys know, was taken to an aquarium in a dentist's office. Can you guys say Trey Maynard? <laughs> and he's stuck in this aquarium. But the crazy thing about the story is, Nemo thinks the whole time that his father's mad at him because he was rebellious and he didn't listen to his dad, so he has it stuck in his head, I have an angry dad. I know that he's not the only one. And Nemo feels like no one is looking for him. And so in this part in the movie, we're going to show this clip, if you can hit the lights. Um, his dad, who was afraid of the ocean and upset with him, he felt like, His father didn't care, but he was completely wrong. And so this scene, the pelican brings the news that his father went on a mission to seek and save his son. Father was different than he thought, church. His father was different than Nemo thought. 
And when he learned his father's heart, you could see it in Nemo's eyes. It made all the difference in the world. Some of you are here this morning, and if you could know the father's heart for you, it would change everything. Some of you here, kind of like Nemo, if you knew that your father wasn't angry at you, that he is not absent, his, your father in heaven, that he's actually concerned with every piece of your life. The Bible says you're the apple of his, high, his eye, your treasured possession. That he sings and he dances over you. If you could see his face when he thinks about you, your life would be different. We need to know that. We need to know the Father's heart. So let's t- uh, take a, a, a moment and read this story. Uh, if you can turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. And we're going to look at verses 11 through 31. I want to encourage you guys. I know I'm not, I say this every week, but bring your Bibles, bring your Bibles. I might start giving out gold stars to people who bring their Bibles. I'm the old generation. I just love to hear the pages being flipped. When you write stuff, you cry, you bl- your tears, the whole deal. But you know what's interesting, and I'm going to start telling you guys in in advance. I'm going to start telling you guys what I'm preaching on so you can read it before you get here. So together we can look at the story. Luke 15. This is a story of unconditional love of God. Charles Dickens says, the great writer, this is the greatest short story ever written. Um, Luke 15, 11 through 31, he's written to the Pharisees and the religious leaders who, as I said earlier, were obsessed with the rules. It was all about the rules. It was about the bloodline and the rules. Everything you had to do, it was all about obedience because if I obeyed God, he loved me more. If I did everything right, then Father's face was shining on me. But when I blew it, he didn't want anything to do with me. That is not just a first century thing. That's a humanity thing. Because everything we do in this life is to earn approval with our jobs in different situations. But God's love's unconditional. That's why it's covenantal love. There's nothing you can do to make you love God love you anymore, and there is nothing that you can do to make God love you any less. And you keep telling yourself that because it goes against everything you ever have grown up in this world to know. Let's read. Luke's 15. One of my favorite stories in the entire Bible, the story I want to tell, and I want to tell, and when I'm 80 years old, I want to tell it again. Luke 15, let me read it to you. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth with wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went out and hired himself as a citizen of that country who sent him to field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, the Bible says, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And I'm going to stop there. And there will be a part two with the older brother. So as we get into this story, in verse 12, you see the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. I don't know if there could be anything more disrespectful to the original hearers 
as a parent, as I read this story, it makes my blood boil. In the first century patriarchal society, the law was clear in Deuteronomy 21, the law of primogeniture, the oldest firstborn son, got a double portion. The eldest son got the double portion of his father's property according to Deuteronomy. So this is completely out of order. And the worst of all, church, is it all happened before the father died. Middle Eastern historian Kenneth Bailey said, to ask for the inheritance while the father is still alive is to wish your father dead. What the younger one was saying here, church, is I want your stuff, but I don't want you. Do you guys hear me? I want your stuff, but I don't want you. And I began to think about this, you know, and as a father of five with four daughters, I get it. I really do. The attitude of entitlement is gets me angry. Someone sent me this the other day. I think it was actually kind of funny with a father of four. Having a daughter is like having a little broke best friend who thinks you're rich. How good is that? True. It's so funny though. Uh, Last week, my 15-year-old daughter, and she's not here so I can talk about her. (laughs) Just don't tell her. Her name's Leafy. I love her to death. But as I've told you before, she's 15, and guess what? She doesn't want to spend any time with me. And I'm so cool. (laughs) When she was 10, she loved me. When she was 11, she loved me. When she was 12, she wanted nothing to do with me. And now she's 15, she doesn't even want to talk to me. So she's 15 years old, and I get this phone call You know, it's just those phone calls. You pick it up, and Elisa's like, I call her Leafy. She said, Dad, let's go to dinner. And I am so excited. I'm like, really? I'm like, Nima, I'm like, really, really? Let's go to dinner. And she, and she, I I just was so excited. I texted Kimber. She invited me to dinner. So I changed my plans. I had three different things to do. I changed them all. I was so stoked. I came to the restaurant, Sonia. And I get this, te- and, I, and, and she sends me a text message, meet me outside. You think you know where this is going? <laughs> so I'm in the parking lot, right? And she comes out, and, uh, and she says, stay in the car, okay? And so she comes out to the car, and I'm like, yeah, so excited. Let's go. She's like, yeah, my friends are here. Can I have some money? I'm like, yeah, sweetie, I would love to pay for you and your friends. We're going to have the best night ever. She said, Dad, I don't think you get it. I want your money, but I want you to stay in the car. How wrong is that? Have you been there? She wants my money, but she didn't want me to come in. So you know what I did? I did what every good dad would do. I gave her three bucks and told her to call an Uber. (laughs) No, no. I didn't. I sat in my car because I love my daughter. I sat in my car. I gave her all the money in my wallet, and I told her to have fun. But just think about that for a minute if you're a dad. How upset, how hurt does it when you have a kid that comes to you and says, I really don't want to be with you, Dad. I just want your money. It hurts. Everything you've ever worked for in your life And your kid has the nerve to come back and say, hey, I want it, and I want it now. Son says, I want the stuff now. Middle Eastern scholar says it like this. He said, the traditional, survey says, oh, oh gosh. The traditional Middle Eastern father could only respond in one way. He would have been expected to drive the boy out with verbal, if not physical, and violent blows. In that culture, it was a patriarchal society. That means they did not handle shame and dishonor to the family like we do today. We give our kids so much, and we put up with so much, but not so back in that culture. In that culture, you did something like that, and your parents had every right to drive you out of the house to drive you out of community, and the community would cheer you on. So even more shocking, we'll keep going in the story, verse 12. Even more shocking, 
he says this. So he divided his property among them. Even more shocking than the ask is the fact that we have a father that said, okay, you can have it. Even though it kills me, I want to let you have it. You take it, you go. The word property here, the Greek word for property actually comes from the word biology. It means life. Do you know what the father was saying in this moment, church? He was saying, the father divided his life between them. In the first century culture, your land was your life. Your wealth and your identity were tied to your land. To lose the land was to lose yourself and lose your standing in community. The son was asking his father to tear his life apart. And I told you about the shame and honor culture. In that culture, according to the Old Testament, if you reached a certain level of shame on your parents because Moses said in the commandments, honor your mother and father and your life will be long, you had a right to take your son out into the community and stone them to death. That's how far. And this father says, take it. What kind of father is this? If you are in that moment and you're a religious leader, and you're listening to this story, you are saying, what kind of father is this? This is not a typical father church. It's not a typical father. This is not a typical angry, frustrated, disappointed, performance-based dad. This was a dad that had unconditional love flowing through him like a river. To add insult to injury, church, verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set out for a distant country and squandered himself in wild living, okay? Rebellion, wild living, drinking, partying, prostitutes, all the father had worked for his whole life. And we know this, that sin can be expensive, can it not, church? Is that amen? Amen. Sin can be expensive, and it can be expensive quick. I can remember before I was a Christian going to bars with all my paycheck, and the thing about when you're in sin, you're not just paying for yourself, are you? You're paying for your idiot friends. <laughs> Sorry. You're paying for your idiot friends, and it gets expensive. Go look at the stars. Go look at some of these athletes. They have hundreds of millions of dollars, and they go bankrupt. Sin gets expensive it might be fun for a moment but in the end the bible said it leads to death i've been there and he wasted all the money all the money his father had had made and then by the grace of god and only the grace of god because you're going to learn this in life some of the things that happened to you that you think were so tragic are actually the grace of god it happened to jonah Charles Spurgeon said, sometimes love letters come in black envelopes. I look back at my life and some of the things that happened to me, some of the brokenness in my life, and it was the grace of God breaking me to the point that I knew my father. I haven't said it yet, but am I preaching to somebody? Okay. Hey, I just did one today. You should be proud of me. The grace of God that there was a famine So he went out and hired himself out to be a citizen of the country to feed pigs. To feed pigs. I know that you guys are biblically illiterate enough, this awesome church, to know how ceremonially unclean this is. This is the bottom of the barrel, the lowest of the low. I don't even know how to compare it. Maybe like, you know, if the Cowboys and the Steelers had a baby? Uh, That's a football joke. It's okay. By the way, the Chargers beat the Chiefs last week. I just needed to say that. Uh, it was so awesome. Thank you, Jesus. I don't even know how to compare the lowest of the low. If you were to touch a pig, you weren't allowed to get back into society. The Jews kn- knew about that. They didn't want anything to do. In fact, they wouldn't even get in a boat to go over to a place that had pigs. That's how low it was. Have you been there before? Because I have. Have you ever been to that broken place? 
where you know the only thing, that, the only thing you have is Jesus? Sometimes God's got to get us there. He's feeding pigs. He was in his father's house. He had, he had wealth. He had honor. He had sonship. And now he's acting like a slave feeding pigs. So, of course, he wants to go back to his father. He wants to come home. But, you know, the, 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 the rabbi said, hey, that was a two-step process. It was not a one-step process. You can say you're sorry, but you also had to make restitution. And restitution means you've got to pay it all back. You've got to pay it all back. So he comes home, and if it's even possible at this time to want to come home, because if I lived in that culture, do you know what I would do? I would stay in Sin City and probably die, because you know in the back of your mind that the community and your father has every right to take your life, and you might never, ever, ever be restored back into community. But the most beautiful picture in the entire Bible happens at this moment. The most beautiful picture in the whole Bible, the clearest picture of the heart of God. If you're to say, church, show me the heart of God. What is the heart of God? It's this verse. Oh, man. Wow. That was intense. I'm, I'm not sure what happened. Okay, there's a demon in my... Uh, let, let me try to get this, because this is really good. I'm sorry, church. How about this? We got this? Okay. All right. Let's go back. Let me read it to you, if you can look at your Bible. But while he was a long way off. His father was filled with compassion for him. And let's say this as a church. I want you to watch this. just to get a visual of what it might have been like. Just to get a visual. So the Bible says here, church, that he ran to meet him. Do you know that Middle Eastern patriarchs, they did not run? Children ran. Noblemen ran. Noblemen didn't run. Because you had to pick up your robe, pull it up, and undignify yourself before the community and run. It was unheard of for a patriarch to run after anything. And you know what? The study that I did this week, this is really interesting. Do you know um, that Arabic translators for a thousand years, they would not translate that the father run to his son. They actually wouldn't put this in the Bible because it was so culturally disrespectful. So they used the word that he was out looking for, the, for him. Or he presented himself. That's what they used. For the Middle Eastern, it was too humiliating to attribute to God so they wouldn't even put in that he ran. But while he was a long way off, the father saw him. I want you to think about this. While he was a long way off, he ran to his son. The father saw him a long way off. And I have a question for you, church. How do you see someone a long way off? Question. How do you see someone a long way off? Only if you're looking for them. Do you hear me, church? The only way that you see them a long way off is if you're looking for them. This is not a dad who's watching football. 
This is not a dad who has his back. He's on his porch and he's looking for his son. And that's when he sees him. Now, I learned another thing that's so good and it really does put me in tears. So, one of the things that the scholars will tell you that is really interesting here is one of the reasons why the father ran to his son because he wanted to get to his son first. Because of his son, when he reached the community, the community had every right to scorn him with condemnation, shame, and guilt. He's filthy. He ruined the father's name. He dishonored them. And before he gets to the town, the father says, I have to get to my son first. Because the first thing that I want him to hear is, I love you. So he runs out and he puts his arm around his son before some of the church people can get to him. Do you all hear what I'm saying? And I think there's a lot of people in the American church that are afraid to come to church because when they come to church, they hear shame and guilt and condemnation as they walk in the doors. And sometimes it's not God why they won't come home, it's our attitudes. And that's why I want this church to be a place where no matter what that person looks like, no matter what you've heard about them in the community, our first reaction is welcome home. (laughs) Welcome home. We're so glad you're here. When I was a youth pastor, kids would come in and their hats would be on. The last thing in the world I would ever say to them is take off your hat in church. Because the first thing I wanted them to know is the love of the Father. Because when you have the love of the Father, guess what? That can actually change your heart. And it's not behavior modification anymore. What if this church, and I believe we're there. What if we had the heart of the Father that everybody that comes here just feels like, wow, I'm so accepted. But no, what we do as Christians is we get these scales out and we're like, well, you need to change this, 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 and this for you to start coming to my Bible study. Where do you get that? That's a misunderstanding of your father's heart. Welcoming. Let me tell you one more thing as we come to a close here. Father went out and he put his arms around him. Do you know that according to the ceremonial, the, how, how dirty he was? He, he was hanging out with pigs. He was hanging out with pigs. That means he was not to be touched. The father said, I don't even care how filthy you are. I don't care that you smell like pigs. I got to get my arms around you. The law would say, oh, you can't touch your son. He's got to go clean up to come to the father. The father said, you have a big misunderstanding. You don't have to clean up to come to me. You come as you are, and I will clean you up. And church, that is the gospel. He bore our shame. And while we were still sinners, can you finish that, church? Christ died for us. See what great love See what great love the Father has lavished. Do you know what this is a picture of? It's lavishing love that we should be called children of God. Lavishing undeserved acceptance and love. And I have to say this too, church, and I know I should put this in two parts. I'm probably out of time, but I have to say this too. You've got to remember something about this encounter. He came to him and kissed him before there was a confession. So before the son could get out, I'm sorry, dad, there was already an embrace and a kiss. The kiss came before the confession. Do you hear me, church? He was not waiting for his come home speech. He said, before you say anything, You don't need to say a word. That's sonship. Son says, I want to be your employee. You don't get it. You're never going to be my employee. You're my son. 
And church, I really believe that if we could get this in our heart, we would never be the same. We think that we need to have these huge come-home speeches, and absolutely we need to repent. We need to confess our sins. But let me tell you about the Father's heart. He wants to embrace you before a word comes out of your mouth because that's what unconditional love is. That's your Father's heart. Now, the crazy thing about unconditional love is once you get it in your spirit, guess what you want to do? You want to change. And that is the door to repentance, not fear, but love. Because perfect love, church, what does it do? It casts out fear. So I want to end with this. Um, He's redefining the heart of the Father. Some of you need to redefine the heart of the Father. And I'm praying that this story did for you today. This is not a works-based performance religion, guys. It's not work-based. It's not like one of those little... You know, those, those little flowers where you pick it. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. I've lived far too long of my Christian life picking off flowers. When I do the right thing, when I say the right thing, he loves me. But when I blow it, when I look at something that I shouldn't, when I treat someone wrong, when I've been an orphan, I pick off that next flower. He loves me not. That is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. He came to set us free from that works-based religion. He loves you because he loves you because he loves you because he loves you because he loves you. So I just want to ask you, I'm going to close with this question, church. What, do you, what, what does Jesus' face look like to you in your head? What do you see when you see the Lord and God, Jesus' face? Do you see like I live for so many years of my life's frustration, or there you'd go again, Jamie, you blew it. Is that what you see? Is that what his face looks like to you, where you're just always blowing it, and he's just kind of like that dad, like, oh, you did it again. I want to I say that the Bible paints a different picture than that face. I want to tell you that, um, I want to be so bold to say to you that when you're in Christ, there's a look on the Lord's face of perpetual and eternal approval from God perpetual approval from God. That when I walked in here today, church, I was approved. And when I walk out of here today, I'm an approved. On my worst day, he's still smiling and singing and loving over me. And I have a decision to accept that. I wanna, I'm closing with a story about my son. Um, I don't know if you know uh, my son, Kaysen, but... Uh, Uh, This 2 Corinthians, I love this picture of Jesus because it's smiling. You see the glory of God in the face of Jesus, the 2 Corinthians says. But this is my son, Kaysen, all right? He's he's, he's a stud. I love him. I'm I'm so proud of him. He actually set the the high school basketball record with 63 points in one game. How awesome is that? He's not here, so you can clap. (laughs) There's no way I'd talk about this guy if he was here. So Kaysen grew up playing basketball. And I grew up as that dad. Do you know what that dad is? The dad that yells too much? Come on, I'm not the only one in this room. You've been there. I grew up watching him play basketball, and I love him so much. And every time he shoots a shot, I can't help myself. What happens is something I learn is that every time that Kaysen shot the ball, or sometimes when he turned the ball over, and this is from when he's a little kid, he starts to look over he looked over at the, at the stands at me every time. So let's just say that he would dribble off his foot. The first thing Case and do would not be getting the play. He'd be looking over to the stands. And it was so bad that his coach actually said, Case and you've got to stop looking at your dad. You know what was happening when he was looking at me? You know what was happening in church? He was looking to see what my facial expressions were. And so when he blew it, Unfortunately, I stand up here with my failure. When he blew it, he saw frustration. He sometimes saw anger. And you know what happened to his basketball game? The more he looked at my face of disapproval, the more he played bad. And there was a moment in my life that I had to own that, that I had to own that as a parent, that I had to, I had to change my facial expression because it was changing the way my son was playing basketball. 
And I want to close with you today, and Charles, you can get ready to come. I want to, I want to close today with you. If you can understand that there's a perpetual smile over your life, it will change the way you play the game. That when you leave here today, that you would know that there is a God. He came as Jesus, and he looks at you, and there's not anger, there's not disappointment. In fact, you, you tell me, look at the scriptures. Was he angry with the woman who was caught in adultery? Oh, no, he wasn't. Was he angry with Zacchaeus that was taking all the tax collecting money? He wasn't angry there either. In fact, where do we get this thing? He's an angry God. You know, Jesus came to erase that. Say, I'm a loving God. Yes, is there anger in sin? There is anger with sin. But when you're under Christ, he looks at you through the lens of Christ and what he sees is his son. So there's perpetual smiling over your life, and you need to know that today. And I want to I close as I ask come, that, that there's a posture that God has over you. And I had this wrong for so many years, and I want you to leave remembering this. Do you know what God's posture over you is? I thought for so many years this was his posture over me. You blew it again. How could you do this? You blew it. But you want to know what his posture is? This is the Lord's posture. This is God's posture. This is not God's posture. You cannot tell me biblically this is God's posture. You know what God's posture is? I want you to come home. I don't care how filthy you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't want how much dishonor you have. I want to accept you as my son. This is his posture. I love you guys.